very much. Uh, so I just love to hear to this session we have about one hour to under one hour to disentangle all the myths about urban uh, food security. Um, by we will break this session for about one minute, actually at noon if you don't mind, uh, for a minute of silence for the uh, victims of the London attack, uh, which is a European uh, commission initiative, and I, I just uh, invite all of us to, to join in. So we have us on stage then, um, I'll give, uh, give him a short sign and we, we break for a minute of silence. Um, this session is about urban food security, but I think um, what we've seen this morning is, is very much the complex link between the urban and the rural areas. And, and the session is about disentangling myths of uh, urban food security. My hope is that once we manage to disentangle at least some of the myths, that might give us an opportunity to actually build it back together um, and come back to what uh, Shane actually mentioned this morning, the broken linkages. And hopefully by disentangling, uh, we actually uh, will be able to uh, put those back together and actually create some of those uh, linkages that are so important for, for food security in general. Um, if you think about myths in the area of, uh, of urban food security, I think many of the myths are actually related to the countryside as well. And I'm just going to very briefly pick up three uh, before I uh, leave the stage to the real experts. Um, and the one, the one myth uh, that comes to mind, I think, is the is knowledge that the countryside feeds the cities. Um, and Kala is no longer here, uh, but her parents are probably... I'm mostly... here! Oh, she's there. She's there. <laughs> she's she's, she's taking the back seats. I yeah. would have <laughs> So be cautious. <laughs> I, think, I think her parents are probably mostly right in saying that the countryside actually permits the cities uh, to, to thrive and prosper. But what we are experiencing in our work as, as kind of one of the big aid agencies uh, coming out of Germany is that in a crisis context, that can very easily flip. Um, and what you see is the, the opposite, where the countryside actually depends on the cities. And I give you one example of uh, what we've experienced at first hand, and maybe some of you as well, which is the case of Liberia, which um, during the Civil War up to 2003, almost the entire country actually moved uh, to the city of Monrovia. Um, and there was no countryside left to actually feed the cities. The whole the structure, all the structures were actually geared towards fight, uh, feeding the cities. Um, but importantly, it wasn't from the internet, it wasn't from the countryside, it was actually from the outside. And Shane actually had a, an appointment on this as well about um, imports in, into cities. So what we see if we tackle that one myth is the, the fact that the relationship is complex and sometimes it's actually the cities taking over the role of um, of feeders and providers uh, of the countryside. And I think we need to get a little more specific on what that means and what that means for policy recommendations as well. The, the second myth um, is that agricultural ministries actually focus on the countryside. Well, that's not quite true, actually, in our experience. What we see very often is that a lot of agricultural policies is actually focused on the cities and is actually focused on where the elections are and where the voters are. Um, and, and that may be understandable, but it can lead to some um, horrible side effects, um, which sometimes you see most easily when actually uh, the pressure has been taken off. If you look at the origin of the Arab Spring, for example, take the, uh, the, um, uh, the food riots uh, in Egypt around 2011, what you see is a lot of subsidies for the, for the urban population on bread. Once the money runs out, um, Subsidies get reduced, prices get up, uh, riots start. Um, and in fact, I'm a historian by training, so I know that that actually goes back all the way to probably 1789 in Paris with a very similar uh, kind of effect. Um, I think the, the challenge here is to make sure that agricultural ministries and agricultural policy actually focuses much more on the countryside, where, where a lot of the problems are, but also a lot of the solutions to the problems that we're talking about. And, and the third myth is one that probably brings together, uh, again, um, the two worlds that we're talking about. And the myth is that there's actually a huge difference between uh, the urban areas and the countryside. And while that's, that's true in some cases, it's not quite true. If you think about the needs and also the capabilities, 
of urban centers and rural centers, actually we see increasing similarities. That we see a lot of production actually happening in the countryside. And again, Turner mentioned that it can never, the city, sorry, in the cities, uh, cities will never be able to feed uh, the entire population. But we know from research that in some African countries, up to a third of vegetables are actually being produced in urban areas. So urban areas are becoming more centers of production. And at the same time, we see with the whole trend towards peri-urbanization, how the countryside is becoming more urban. If you look at M-Pesa, for example, the, the mobile banking in, that started in Kenya, how that's bringing banking to the countryside. Again, you see a lot of moving together of needs and capabilities. Um, there's always going to be a difference, but I think it helps for us to think of those two, uh, two phenomena together and, and think of what the common needs are. And I think we've mentioned them uh, a lot the, earlier this morning, uh, the, the need for market access in both directions and the need for social protection in both areas, the urban and the rural. Uh, so without those three myths, I wanted to start the discussion and hand over uh, to the experts. Um, we've got uh, two fantastic speakers today. Uh, one is uh, Rodney, Rodney Mushul Garuara, more or less. Um, <laughs> you know, by, we know by Rodney. Rodney is actually a great partner of, um, um, of our organization, WNJ, um, working out of Zimbabwe uh, with the Agricultural Partnership Trust, um, APT. Uh, he's an agricultural economist um, and very focused on market linkages. In fact, he's a market linkage advisor. Um, for ATB. He's going to share his experience. Um, and we've got uh, an academic perspective uh, as well from probably one of the most renowned um, uh, experts on uh, urban rural linkages, uh, which is Einar schmidt kallert who was a regional planner and social scientist um, until recently a professor uh, at Dortmund University. Um, and uh, one person who's dedicated his research life. I'm not sure about the rest of your life, actually, but at least his research life um, to the focus on urban rural linkages. Uh, so I'd like to invite um, first Einar uh, schmidt kallert um, to come and present, and then Rodney, and I'll give you a sign at noon for a moment of silence. Thanks very much for being here. Professor schmidt kallert the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, too, for the introduction. Uh, the title of my presentation is Urban Rural Linkages and Multilocational Livelihoods. That's one particular myth which I'm going to identify fairly soon. But um, let me start by saying I'm very happy about this event. Uh, Till has mentioned that I uh, spent quite some time doing research on urban rural linkages, maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago when um, I attended meetings like this one. Well, they were segregated. On the one hand, you would attend meetings of urban management experts. And on the other hand, uh, the rural development people. And uh, uh, when I timidly mentioned that uh, in order to fully understand organization, one has to take urban rural linkages into consideration. So, uh, well, uh, there was a mixed reaction, and uh, likewise, well, uh, the same happened with the other organs. But now, apparently, this situation has changed, and I think uh, uh, this is a good achievement. In recent years, there's renewed interest in the study of urban rural linkages in spatial planning, in social sciences, uh, sciences but also at the policy level. So I think uh, one document which uh, I should like to mention is the World Development Report 2009, which was entitled Reshaping Economic Geography, and it dealt with the relationship between leading and, uh, and lagging regions between rural areas metropolises. Then, of course, uh, recently, last year, uh, the new um, agenda uh, was um, uh, ratified in Quito by heads of state and representatives of states and uh, uh, in various uh, places in the new urban agenda there's mention of the linkages. We commit ourselves to support territorial systems 
that integrate urban and rural functions. We commit ourselves to encourage urban and rural interactions and connectivity and so on. And maybe in my next presentation on a similar topic, I would mention this event here and the Global Food Policy Report, which is uh, with its emphasis on the linkages. Okay, uh, for me, this is an important reorientation at the global policy level. <laughs> but, um, well, of course, uh, and there's always uh, something to criticize. And I think um, uh, when uh, one looks at these various policy statements, the reports, there's a tendency to look at aggregates, at migration flows, commodity flows, money flows. Yeah, well, this is important, no doubt about this. But one also needs to look at the people, the people's perspective, the actor's perspective, in order to fully understand what is happening in an organization, why people behave the way they actually behave. We need to understand how migrants organize their livelihoods, how and why they take the decision to move away from the countryside into the city, but uh, some others decide to stay in the village, and some of them prefer to live uh, in more than one location, in the countryside and in the city at the same time. And I think we need to have a close look at what is happening within the household. Linkages, urban rural linkages, at the household level, within the household. This basically is the topic of my presentation. And now I'm coming to the myth I'm going to disentangle. Common misconception on the nature of migration, which is still very prevalent with most policy makers and also a large number of researchers. That is this contention, this idea that migrants make once in a lifetime decision to leave their home village and settle in the city. So obviously this is based on empirical evidence uh, during the Industrial Revolution in Europe, in the United States, and in Japan, but it doesn't hold for the Global South. And um, when we look at uh, the global migration trends, uh, there are so many reports on global migration, the end reports, IRM reports, and uh, we can read everywhere, migration has become more female, it involves more families uh, these days, and some of them also mention that there's more non-permanent migration these days in, than in previous times. And, uh, well, uh, the next statement, which I have uh, I typed in bold, is a sweeping statement. Because uh, I don't have figures, but uh, I have uh, references. So, I should like to say here, the majority of all migrants in the Global South tend to be non-permanent. There's uh, evidence from China. For China, we have the statistics because of the legal situation, the so-called Hupo system. So there's a, uh, a clear count of the number of migrant workers. The majority of them, or 99% well, of them, are non-permanent migrants. But uh, for the rest of the world, uh, evidence is scanty because, uh, uh, because uh, uh, the non-permanent character of migration doesn't show up in official statistics, doesn't show up in census data. But Scientists from India, social scientists and demographers from India contend that uh, these days most of migration on the subcontinent is non-permanent and the same uh, well, if I, for many sub-Saharan African countries one can say the same based on sampled surveys. So people who are looking for survival options in the urban sector they normally do not cut their ties to the rural base. They rather return to the villages at certain time of the year and they retain economic linkages. Uh, so, 
a new trend has emerged in migration research, which is uh, a trend of research on multi-locational households, their livelihoods, their livelihood strategies, how the households organize their livelihoods. Well, um, most migrants normally don't take decisions as individuals. They are embedded in a household, a family normally, and uh, they are part of a household, and uh, they take, don't take the migration decision their own, uh, on their own. So it's important uh, to refer to the household as the key actor in the system. Um, and uh, uh, those people who have done research on these strategies, they have coined the term multi-locational household. Uh, this is obviously means uh, that people live um, in another location at certain times of the year, but there are internal linkages within the household. Other researchers, just to note this, mentioned uh, that uh, uh, this uh, makes sense. They say, um, we should rather speak of networks. I contend that we have to speak of households. The conventional term household, well, you find uh, all kinds of definition on household, but most of them are related to one location. So uh, in Africa, we have census definitions of household. What is a household? The people eating from the same pot, very nice. People uh, living under the same roof. And then you can easily say, when people live in more than one household, it doesn't make sense, it's no longer a household. But I do contend that the linkages within this household, between the two parts of the household, are so, um, so close that uh, one can only understand it if we consider them as one unit. So here I'm giving one definition, which um, I used in a uh, publication a uh, research report on uh, multi-locational household strategies in China. Multi-locational household is made up of members from the same family or kin, pooling their economic resources and planning together the expenses for the purpose of reproduction of all household members, but the members may well live in two or more spatially split locations. So this uh, refers to the short term, um, uh, sustenance of the family, earning money, enough money uh, to make ends meet, but also for the long-term planning, future of the children, education of the children, and so on. Okay, I will now uh, proceed by giving you a few examples, just uh, showing examples from uh, different uh, research projects, which give evidence of uh, the strength of these informal linkages. So the first one is a fairly old study, which uh, I'm presenting here because it was an eye-opener for myself. Uh, way back in uh, uh, the 80s of last century, I did a study on resettlement villages along Volta Lake in Ghana. And uh, then we found out in this study that uh, a number of households uh, are, well, have delegated members of the household to the urban area who are still part of the household economy. And obviously those households which have these uh, family members delegated to the urban labor market, they are better off than the rest of uh, the villagers in the same place. And um, I can uh, well, I would like to show you this diagram to show what is happening. Uh, so we have uh, uh, the uh, uh, we have rural-based household members in the village. We have the urban-based household members in the city, and uh, uh, the economic uh, well, they're part of economic circuits. So there's subsistence production, but there's also uh, local marketing, and uh, then uh, there's uh, uh, and they are the urban household members earning a cash income. But what matters and what makes this household particularly resilient is the fact that uh, uh, there's cash remittances from here to the village and this is 
especially essential at the time before planting, at the time when uh, villagers normally have very little money left, and, uh, and then they can buy seeds, they can buy fertilizers, and later on, after harvesting, their in-kind transfers of yams and ground nuts uh, to, uh, the, uh, to the urban area, which uh, uh, are then sold or bartered by the household members in, uh, in the urban area. Is it one o'clock? Ah, two more minutes. Okay. Okay. Another example uh, by another researcher, which was done in uh, South Africa. Uh, While well, the distance between the villages and uh, the city is even larger, about 1,000 kilometer, a specific form of multi-locational households was established. The rural section of the household looks after small children and the elderly and produces food. The urban household members earn the cash income. That means in addition uh, to the flow of money, there are also social services which are important in this reciprocity within the household. And another study uh, which I did in uh, the course of the <coughs> project for FAO in 2005 in Armenia, um, well, here we identified that in this village of Norazienka in Armenia, uh, one third of all the households have delegated members to their own leather market in Russia, in Tumen, in Siberia, or in Moscow to earn cash income for the family. And uh, one could study in detail how this helped to finance repairs of the irrigation system in, irrigate, in, in the vineyards, in uh, the irrigated agriculture, and, uh, but there was also another element that uh, uh, the parents used to send uh, their children during the long school holidays to Armenia for cultural reasons, in order to expose them uh, to, the, uh, to an environment where Armenian was spoken and where they could learn the, in the, uh, the, the Armenian script as well. And, uh, well, then, Initially, most of the migrant workers migrated to the three um, conurbations, mega cities, Beijing, Shanghai, Pearl River Delta. And uh, in the last 15 years, uh, many of them have also migrated to Wuhan and um, Chongqing, inland uh, mega cities which have emerged. Migrant workers. Uh, while well, one third of the migrant workers uh, are uh, employed in manufacturing, one third in uh, uh, construction, in the construction industry, and a uh, certain percentage is uh, doing some odd jobs, 
and uh, even um, constituting an informal sector in China. Living quarters of migrant workers on the right of this picture. Well, part of uh, the story of uh, this massive and unprecedented migration, non permanent migration, is the fate of the children. And, uh, an estimated 50 million left behind children in the care of their grandparents in the villages. And uh, now let's briefly look at what is happening economically within the household. So I'm uh, showing you one example uh, from our study of household economies. This is a uh, migrant worker uh, from Henan province, and uh, he is uh, uh, he works in Beijing. Wife, the wife and two children, school, school boy and children are still in the village. And what is happening within the multi-locational household is uh, the monthly remittances sent home to the family, but the father of the family regularly returns to the village to help with the farm work. And then there's in-kind transfer of agricultural produce to Beijing. In addition, there are all kinds of linkages within the expanded family network, sister, brother, aging parents, and so on. So there's an extended support network, but it's important uh, to note that this is the core economic unit. The family next door and uh, with the family next door, it's a bit different. Uh, there in that family, wife and husband are both in the city, and then <coughs> the child is left in the care of the grandparents. So this is what's, hap what's happening within the household. Why? Well, uh, a bit of theory. One can differentiate between different types of linkages from these studies is, mm, becomes evident. Very important is the economic reciprocity. Strategies for caring are important. Caring for old elderly people, for children. Also exchange of values and beliefs. One, uh, two researchers from India have said uh, that one also has to differentiate between coping and accumulative household strategies. Well, it's important, uh, very often it is just a strategy to make ends meet, but there are also cases where it's part of the strategy for upward social mobility. Okay, so the conclusions are the households studied in uh, these various projects consciously live in two or more locations which are spatially split, and uh, their livelihood strategy takes advantage of both urban and rural opportunities. And uh, well, uh, when we talk about what needs to be done in the practical world, because uh, earlier on there was the call for recommendations uh, from this session, I could now identify um, possible interventions, but we will have a number of case studies in uh, the remaining time of this morning session and in the afternoon. And uh, well, I just want you uh, to, uh, uh, to consider whether certain interventions can be, um, uh, can be designed which strengthen the internal economic exchange within the households. Okay, uh, so uh, this is a list of uh, selected literature on from the academic world, so I think uh, I need to give some references. If you're interested, I can uh, I'll show you the studies or give you the references. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Anna uh, This was the more theoretical part um, of the VR session. Before we move to Rodney, I suggest um, we, we give Ina Trincolor the opportunity to answer a couple of questions. So there are one or two from the audience. Please be brief. Yes, the gentleman. Uh, just 
Thank you. I'm working for a European Commission development platform on agricultural research. Now, could you extend this concept of multi-locational livelihood strategies to on a global level, including the diaspora? Let's take one or two more, and then we answer them. Another gentleman with glasses. No, uh, yeah, but thank you. Thank you very much. The, um, the Chinese situation has changed quite drastically recently. The government actually encouraged the, uh, the uh, rural migrants to settle in the cities to bring their family, including children, to the cities uh, as part of the push of urbanization for economic growth. Although, you know, I'm Personally, this is that approach. Actually, they can work and work. Uh, but to let you know that, uh, yes, it's actually situation changed quite a bit uh, recently. Uh, but in terms of uh, the implication of food and nutrition security, uh, obviously, it's a multi uh, location of the households uh, help to reduce a lot of risks. It, it actually started in Japan. Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, China, and so on. So, part time farming in, uh, let's say, in uh, peak season and meantime, part time. Uh, uh, the service jobs in, in cities. Uh, I think uh, it's very interesting to look at uh, the implication of food and nutrition security. To me, it's actually quite a positive in, in many instances. But uh, on the other hand, uh, because the, uh, these rural migrants do not have permanent residence in cities, they are very much discriminated against them because of their, uh, their access to social protection, to education, to health, and so on. These are one of the areas I think we need to pay more attention to. Thank you very much. Last question. Also from gentlemen without glasses this time, so we have a lot of uh, no gender diversity, but at least spectacle diversity. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Herbert Swinger from Game. Um, I have a question. Do we have a quantification of how much of this the economy and the food supply is going through the mechanism that you described versus the total food supply? Is it Yeah, uh, first question first, uh, diaspora, well, I have not made any differentiation between permanent and one, uh, between, uh, between uh, international and um, internal migration. I think uh, uh, we have multiplication strategies both between, uh, uh, between places in different countries and between uh, locations within the same country. But um, well, when you talk about China, which is a huge country, distances are large. Uh, <laughs> some migrants, uh, some migrant workers, uh, uh, they establish a second home 2,000 kilometers away uh, uh, from home. And uh, uh, when you look at Europe, well, this is about the same distance between Turkey and Germany, for example. Uh, so, in terms of distance and um, uh, the um, possibility to return home in between, uh, uh, the difference is not that big. Of course, uh, in terms of the legal system, uh, there are differences. But yes, I think uh, one has to study multi-locational household strategies among international migrants as well. So there's uh, a need for this as well. Okay, uh, then uh, yes, uh, uh, there's been a change of government policy in China. This is another uh, topic, this uh, new style of urbanization policy, which has been proclaimed by the Chinese government uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, this uh, may change, uh, may bring about change. Uh, so the legal system, the HUCO system, is uh, definitely one reason uh, for people to maintain uh, the situation of uh, migrant workers, but uh, there may be some other economic reasons as well which contribute uh, to their decision. As far uh, as the general level, you mentioned that um, uh, multi locational livelihoods are uh, an asset. Yes, I would also say they are an asset because uh, uh, they help. Uh, uh, these households uh, to uh, to diversify 
and to, uh, to diversify uh, their incomes and uh, to reduce risks, risk reducing strategy in many settings and uh, this is positive but uh, obviously one also needs to look at uh, the negative implications. Um, uh, let's think about um, uh, 250 million migrant workers in China traveling back to the home village all um, during the period of, uh, of uh, the spring festival. Uh, what a massive impact this has on, on, uh, on the world climate, things like that. So uh, I think um, uh, for me, I consider uh, this establishment of multi-locational households fact and uh, one has to, just like we con uh, I consider uh, urbanization a given fact and, uh, and then we have to develop strategies uh, to assist those people who are part of uh, this process. Uh, then, um, uh, well, the last question, total food supply and um, no, I, I don't have uh, uh, statistics on that. As I said, statistics on multiplication and arguments are scanty anyway. Uh, it's even difficult to establish the numbers of, uh, of people living in multi-locational household arrangements in India. They're estimates by various scientists uh, and the uh, same applies uh, to Africa. Uh, there are estimates about uh, the flow of remittances, but uh, uh, there's uh, uh, very little information on uh, uh, the flow of uh, income transfers within the household, which is also, well, I think, you know, uh, an important part of uh, the household economy. All right, thank you very much. Let's uh, hear a few practical examples now uh, from uh, our champion of uh, value chains, agribusiness marketing, which is uh, roughly the floor is yours. Uh, afterwards, we'll have uh, a few minutes, again, after about 15 minutes or so, for questions to Robbie and then uh, to the panel as a whole. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, too, for the introduction. I'm inviting us to share our experience. Um, my presentation will focus on um, the challenges and opportunities for small water farmers in the organizing um, world. <laughs> Firstly, I would like to take a look at um, the urbanization experience in Zimbabwe, look at a few statistics of uh, Zimbabwe um, and the uh, So, Zimbabwe is a country, a small country in the southern part of Africa, um, a population of about um, 15.6 million, according to the data that was collected in 2015. Um, the, of the 15 million <coughs> population is about 32.4 percent of the total population. Then Harare is the capital city of Zimbabwe with a population of 2.1 million. Then Lawayo is the second largest city with a population of 600,000 plus uh, people. The rate of urbanization uh, is estimated to be around 2.3 percent. <coughs> Um, then going into how many people drive their land uh, from agriculture is about seventy percent uh, of the total population. The different um, different um, um, call them? the different classes of farmers. We have uh, 0 0.05, 0 0.05 of farmers being the large scale. Um, then communal at 84.5 million farmers. This is the small water guys <coughs> whom we normally target the poor guys with an average acreage of less than five acres. Um, then the A1 and A2, they are about 10.5 percent of the total farmers. This A1 and A2 are a result of the land reform that was done in um, the early 2000s. Then with the old resettlement, who were resettled just after independence, who compose of 4.9% of the total farmers in Zimbabwe. Urbanization uh, is creating opportunities uh, for rural farmers. I'll point at HOC, and this is where we are implementing a program, uh, the Simba program. Uh, you can see the distance from Gokwe to Harare, which is the major city, some 300. 50 km 
kilometers sail from Ohe to Lawayo. Uh, Lawayo is um, somewhere. It's also about 360 kilometers from where we are implementing the program. Then focusing on the current situation and the needs that are commonly believed, uh, Zimbabwe experiences periodic drought and food insecurity. Most horticulture and fruits, uh, they are coming from neighboring South Africa. Um, cereal, we are importing from South Africa and Zambia. Then uh, there is a common belief that, uh, among the private sector and the consumers that import quality is better than the local quality. The second um, belief is small water farmers, they have no capacity to consistently produce the market desired quality. So I'll go into the SIMA program, I'll be with, um, we, in designing the market program, we wanted to prove to the private sector that small water farmers can produce the quality and can produce consistently. So I'll go into the SIMA program and brief on what the SIMA program is. It's a four-year funded EU funded program implemented by the Kinga Youth in partnership with the Agricultural Partnership Trust, being implemented in Kokwe South District of Zimbabwe. Um, uh, in as much as I will focus on the horticulture, which is more clearly it is between rural and urban, we have other value chains that um, we promoted, which farmers are producing, that has got a link between um, the rural and the markets. We're working with ETG on sesame production. Uh, all the sesame being produced was going to Mo Mozambique, was being exported to Mozambique. Um, and to my knowledge, uh, sesame oil is quite expensive and it's mainly for the urban markets. Then we had another company that we worked with uh, doing flower seed production. That was a small program. Um, the, all the flower seed, the cosmos and the seniors were being exported into the Netherlands. Then we worked on, with green trade on mang bean production. Um, so with mang, initially we designed this as a cash crop. Um, but later we realized that farmers love the mang bean. Um, instead of marketing, they ended up eating, consuming the mang. The mang. The common actually struggled to get enough volumes to, to export. So we have nutrition impact on, with the mang. Then we worked with another company. Um, it was more on the input services. They will provide the, the unique variety of maize, a biofortified maize variety called quality protein maize. Um, so that was more on the nutrition. Then with natural tested seeds, we're doing sorghum and cowpea seed production. Um, uh, that was the small the farmers producing uh, the seeds. Then lastly, we promoted the chilies with better agriculture. The African desert chilies are being produced for Nando's, which is a fast food um, shop. Um, so the fast food market is mainly for the urban population. Um, so all the chilies, about 26% of Nando's chili global are coming from Okra now. We introduced this program in 2014. So we are on, in all the value chain design that we do, we are guided by the strategic, the dollar strategic framework whereby in the middle we have the core transaction between the farmer and the market. Then on the top with the supporting function, which we normally call the service markets. Then underneath we have the rules and norms. So the rules and norms they've got an overarching effect on the function of any value chain. But uh, as implementing partners, we have very little that we can do during the time of the program to change the rules and um, the regulations that are, in, uh, that are put by the government. Um, but this has got a very big impact on how the value chain can work. Then on the service market, um, there's a common mistake that many implementing partners um, do, not out of will, but at times, um, how to try to get things done. Um, we normally get involved, end up getting involved in the system. For example, when we did the horticulture program, we subsidized the inputs. Um, the financial services were the ones between the markets and um, the farmers, paying the farmers. 
because the, there was case shortage uh, in the economy and the private sector wasn't willing to work directly with the smallholder farmers to come within the rural areas. So we ended up facilitating that role. But now we have taken a role a financial institution. What's going to happen when we pull out as a program? Um, we also ended up providing the storage um, farmers. There is no infrastructure in the rural areas to provide for the storage. The transport system, um, that's another, another one. I'll give an example. At times, the truck from the private sector would have breakdowns. Farmers have harvested the peas in the carrot. Uh, it's quite hot in Bokwe, and the quality is deteriorating. I'll be forced at times to call, uh, call midnight uh, to call a uh, project, and we get approval to get a truck to save farmers' produce. Um, so that's the, a bit about the strategic framework for the market design. Then how the two myths that I want to, to disentangle, uh, that we managed to disentangle through the Simba program was um, farmers can produce the desired crop quality um, in as much as we get from uh, the imports. Our farm, all they need is the knowledge on how to produce. Initially, we had a problem, the market, they didn't want the green shoulder carrots, uh, the fork roots, but the causes for the green shoulder is just exposure to the sun. So one, when we told the farmers that if you, if you don't have the carrot, this is what happens, the problem was solved. And um, the quality was good. One of the major distributors, primary markets that we were targeting, stopped uh, imports from SA for about four months, taking from Okwe. Then production capacity, um, the farmers that we worked with, uh, you can see that's produced from one farmer. They managed to for six months, we were producing five tons of carrots that was going into Harare and Blawai market. Every Tuesday, we were going to Blawai every Friday Harare for six months uh, of the program. So we managed to prove to the private sector that farmers can, they have the production capacity. They know what they are doing, they have been farming all their lives. All they need is the information on which crops to produce and what quality to, to produce. Then going into depth on the horticulture, the challenges and opportunities that we see. Um, a bit of a background of the horticulture program. We the total area for all the crops that were promoted was 27 hectares, working with about 1,207 farmers. Um, one, that was 132 gardens. 14 of them were community gardens where farmers worked together. The major markets were sold in Arari, then refresh in Lawayo, then in smaller markets and informal markets within the big two cities. For the program, we managed to, our farmers managed to supply 110 metric tons of fresh produce that was carried between butter, onion, and peas that was marketed into every market, either through the formal channels or through the informal markets. Um, uh, we managed to oversupply the beetroot in Zimbabwe, and part of the beetroot was exported to Mozambique, which, um, which was a positive development. And we, uh, we managed to prove to the private sector that farmers can really produce um, for the markets. On average, farmers made profits, but um, to be honest, the program didn't work. We're so much involved in terms of organizing farmers, coordinating, and everything. Um, so we dropped the program, we didn't continue after 2014. Um, on button, that's produce one, of one farm of butternut. Um, so with butternut farmers, they still continue to produce. Um, they are now doing for their families, they love the butternut. So in as much as we wanted to raise, improve the incomes, we now have the nutritional impact um, on, the, on the communities. <coughs> Uh, then there's carrot aggregation um, and marketing of carrots. A carrot. Uh, then going into the for the formal market that we experienced, um, the first challenge uh, was poor access to information on demand, quality, and prices. Farmers they, they don't have access to that information. There's no link between the market or the informal and formal market with the farmers. Then secondly is the delay in payments. Um, 
I think as we go to the formal markets, um, they've got systems to say maybe every Tuesday this is when we pay. So for farmers, they want money to go to the grinding mill. They constantly need money. So when the delay happens, they neglect the crop because they are not realizing um, the income the time. Then the third with the farmers, the third challenge was poor organization of both production and marketing. There are trust issues. They can't trust one another to work together. They would rather entrust me to give their produce than to work together. So that was a big challenge. Then low again in power and poor confidence of small water farmers negotiating with big companies. Um, for the companies, the challenge was they, they always complain about the high transaction cost working with 1,200 farmers as compared to calling one supplier, uh, maybe from SAO within local um, market. Then the second issue, working with small water farmers, the issue to do with traceability, uh, to say who's supplying the wrong quality produce is quite difficult. Then, um, the other challenge is private sector, they are not really willing to invest in working with rural smallholder farmers, or is it a case that they don't see the business opportunity that is with the smallholder farmers? In the third slide, I mentioned that 84% of the farmers are smallholder farmers. Um, so we can't run away of the change in the agrarian sector that we now have more smallholder farmers than large scale commercial farmers. That's only like production. You can see each farmer was bringing in um, his small sack of, um, of onion. I'll check how many scotch cuts are there. Instead of sharing transport, they, they didn't want to work together for those simple tasks. So that was just an illustration of challenge uh, farmers were put together. Then there were informal market challenges and the cross challenges that affected both formal and informal markets. The, on the informal market, is the major problem with the informal markets is the volatile market demand and prices. Farmers can't really plan with that. The other day you may go, there's excess demand, the other day um, the demand is low, the price might be low. Then there are no standards to break in. A tomato is a tomato within the informal markets. There's no incentive that you have brought in bigger tomato or better quality tomato will pay you a premium. The no standards of measurements. Normally in the formal market, the standard of measurement is the volumetric, which varies from one buyer to the next. Um, then the cross-cutting challenges that affected the whole working of the program was the poor infrastructure, the transport, the road. Um, there were no infrastructure for storage. The road was built in the transport. Uh, it was a challenge to get more fresh produce. Then the other challenge is formal extension institutions. They mainly focus on traditional crops, the cereals, and the legumes. Um, um, so farmers, they don't realize opportunities within the higher value chain, um, other higher paying value chains. Then low financial literacy. Uh, farmers, they don't own bank accounts. There's a liquidity crisis forcing everyone within the market economy to switch to electronic money, but farmers are used to be paid in cash. So it is quite difficult for farmers to adapt to that system to go to a buyer and sell their produce and be told we are going to pay you electronically. Then there's competition from big suppliers who enjoy economies of scale. At times they push too much produce um, at low prices because they are making profit out of the volumes and it really kills the small guys. The low capacity of rural small water farmers to invest in research and development to explore new opportunities. That's another challenge. Um, the last uh, uh, that I had on my list is poor service markets, the transport and payment solution. In as much as we would want to adapt to electronic payment, we don't have the infrastructure in the rural areas to support um, those um, transactions. Then on the opportunities for small water farmers, the increase in urban population uh, presents an increase in demand for their produce. There's also spillover effect from production from urban markets to local markets, um, like the butternut. When we did the care of the communities, didn't necessarily eat care of but if they continue to grow or even the mango, they never knew of any man. But when they started to grow, they started eating, and the market, local markets started to 
to work in private sector investments in rural areas. There's you know, opportunities with programs such as ours that really prove that private sector smallholder farmers have capacity to produce, to see more private companies coming to invest in the communities. Then contract farming could solve the other problems that are associated with the open market systems. Um, then the other opportunity is value adding, um, uh, value addition in the rural areas, creating employment for the youth and the local people. Then there's a growing demand for organic goods. Um, this is another opportunity for the smallholder farmers. Then opportunities for the private sector in an urbanizing world is the smallholder farmers are not specialized, unlike the big <coughs> commercial guys. When you go to a dairy farm, you expect to be a dairy produce only. But for smallholder farmers, you get groundnut, you get different crops. That so these are opportunities for companies to take on other business uh, opportunities that are not necessarily in their line of business. Then um, the other opportunity to manage the, the problem which private sector is always complaining about flexibility working with a large number of uh, farmers is to take on ICT. Um, then uh, uh, the other opportunity for private sector um, is with the marketing. If they can sensitize that they are marketing, they are buying from local. I will be more proud to buy produce that was produced by my grandfather or by my aunt in the rural areas than an import. Uh, so that's an opportunity for the private sector. Then the growing demand for organic um, goods is another opportunity. Um, then the, this is the last two. Uh, recommendations for farmers. Um, the biggest recommendation, although there are other factors, but the biggest recommendation is the need to overcome trust issues and organize and work together for their benefits. To private sector, <coughs> they need to develop new business model, invest in small water agriculture and young people, um, need uh, to engage in rural regions in compliance with international valid labor and social standards. They need to invest in ICT for development. In recommendations to national governments, um, they need to hold their promise that uh, to invest in agriculture, like for the Southern Africa, there's the Maputo Declaration, which says 10% goes towards agriculture. But um, I don't think that has been um, honored. They need to promote reforms. Um, that uh, rule of law that create an enabling environment for the companies um, to work with the smallholder farmers. They also need to develop sustainable service markets together with the government, together with the private sector. It's not necessarily a role of the private sector who are focusing on payment solutions to go create the infrastructure, but government needs to play a role maybe in financial literacy awareness of the electronic money. Then identify ways to target youth and reverse the age in the rural population. We need to involve the youth um, in, the, in the production. The nutrition education is needed to increase the market base and demand for some crops that are not known within the communities. Then to implement in partners, they can assist farmers with visions through sharing success stories and exchange visits. Lastly, as a way forward, um, after realizing that the major problem that was affecting the functioning of the market between the smallholder farmers and the, the market was to start farmer trainings, commodity group um, trainings on group dynamics and sharing success stories of good groups so that farmers can learn to work together. Um, then, um, this pertains to both implementing partners and donors. We need to distinguish between productive and um, the poorest farmers. There are some farmers, in as much as you make interventions to help them, they will remain poor. So we need to distinguish uh, between those who remain the social workers and those that are productive. Then uh, we also need to find ways of getting affordable finance for the productive farmers. I'll give you an example. We are, we facilitated one farmer to get a loan, but it was the interest rate was for, for more than about 40%, which was quite high. Then um, donors, I mentioned in the donor that very little that we can do to influence the policy environment. Um, so 
need donors to negotiate with governments to create a new employment environment um, for small companies to work with the small water farmers. Thank you. Sorry for cutting you short. Uh, we would have loved to listen to you more, but unfortunately, time is running out and you deserve your lunch. So, what I suggest is uh, I invite Rodney and Anna back on stage for a final round of questions, and then our master of ceremonies tells us how much time we have for lunch after. <laughs> 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 Just shifting the blame on him. <laughs> All right, questions. Uh, yes, the gentleman with the glasses again. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't catch your name. I didn't catch your name first time. Yes. We are all aware that the land ownership is very sensitive in Zimbabwe. Now, I want to quote Professor Thomas Jane, who is a professor from Wisconsin University. He gave an I found fascinating webinar just two weeks ago. And he says the following thing, not only about Zimbabwe, but for the whole area. And it's about <clears throat> what are the causes and consequences of changing farm size distribution in sub-Saharan Africa? And maybe as donors we have been under investigating this <clears throat> because the, several, the figures are quite daunting. In just five years' time, we have now major scale farms are controlling about 20% of the total farmland in Kenya. 32% in Ghana, 39% in Tanzania, and 50% of the land is owned by medium scale farms in Zambia, 50%. Now I think this is a paradigm shift <coughs> because he would state the rapid rise of major scale holdings in most cases reflects an increased interest in land by urban based professionals or influential rural people. The rise of medium-scale farms is affecting the region in diverse ways that are difficult to generalize, but many such farms are a source of dynamism, technical change, and commercialization of African agriculture. And evidence shows that the rise of bigger farms is encouraging a new entry and investment by large-scale traders and more concentrated marketing channels as well as great use of mechanization. Now I think we can witness this shift because I was two years in Tel Aviv with 100 Kenyan agri-entrepreneurs. When I was checking their profiles, 90% of those agri-entrepreneurs were not coming from an agricultural background. They were urban investors in real estate discovering agriculture. So, when I look to your last chart, slide where you say <coughs> that donors should create an enabling environment, I think donors have to discover that there's a new actor in Africa, which is probably very dynamic. And it's a bit contrasting with the subsistence farmer approaches which we have as a mainstream to Thank you very much. <coughs> Additional, we do the same thing again. We connect just a few, um, few examples to the gentleman in the back. Still no gender diversity. Oh, no. And sorry, you were first. I apologize. You you were first. You go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jorge from FAO. I'm a food systems uh, officer. I'd like to, I really appreciate the two presentations. And I'd like to, to make a couple of questions, real quick, real <coughs> and also a, a comment on the issue of biodiversity. Uh, the example that you just gave, the success behind or, you know, this story in, in your country, seems like uh, we, we don't have any other uh, way to go but align for the quality that, uh, that we are used to, the quality that's bombarded by uh, the international trade, by the uh, supermarkets, and what I'm trying to say is, in the end, we still take many successful stories, like my country, Costa Rica, where uh, there was a lot of uh, economic growth and small borders, but they had to ch shift from indigenous varieties to the, the quality that the consumers they wanted. 
So at the end, instead of uh, having 90 varieties of pineapples, now we have two or one. So I wonder if we are promoting this. And then at the same time, a country like Costa Rica had to come up with, to stop with controversial rules such as um, barriers, phytosanitary barriers, or keeping up with the varieties of uh, avocado from different altitudes as to avoid the import, high imports from, from other uh, countries. Well, or we will have to, or they will have to change to has variety all over the the, the country. So what I like to pick up on that. Uh, what what do you think? Is how come is it the solution to educate the urban consumers? Also, we talk. You you actually mention about the aggregation and the cost of transaction and logistics. Several of the activities that I do and have in the ground, it has to do with logistics systems. And when you talk about uh, this with uh, large corporations and uh, universities like CUNY Logistics University, they actually believe uh, the, they have the numbers to, to say small producers are more efficient. The problem is the transportation, that's where it is. it's hard to have plurality of actors, but, but we should have plurality of producers because they're more efficient. There's several costs that are embedded into the same producer. So it seems like we're not doing a good job in organizing the small producers. Then. The transportation will be another issue. Too. And just a real quick a comment uh, I'm coordinating the uh, next per meeting for the implementation of the New York Agenda actually next, next week in New York, which is following up the, a very successful expert meeting prior to the, the uh, uh, final document on the European Agenda, which uh, helped to uh, negotiate, to help the, into the negotiation of the, of the member countries, which ended up with this uh, element that uh, Mr. Smith uh, mentioned. I, I would love to talk to some of you to see if uh, maybe some of you will be willing to join us uh, next week. Thank you. Thanks very much. We have time for two more questions. There was a gentleman at the back end of the and I'm sure we can continue with questions even into lunch. That is, while we have lunch. I'm a Latin University of uh, my question goes to both speakers and on how to make the rural, uh, the rural settings more attractive for youth to stay in agriculture rather than uh, uh, targeting um, cities where the income opportunities are very high and what they can earn in, uh, in, in, in the, the, the urban settings is uh, far more than what can the rural area afford for them. So, uh, like you have mentioned that the, don the donors, this is, could, not, could not be a, a, a goal of a donor to, to do this. But what is the solution in your opinion? Especially uh, when, uh, as the means of the multi-location uh, uh, livelihood, household livelihood is applied, and uh, in uh, transparent dimensions. Thank you. Thanks very much. Final question. Finally, gender diversity. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Nazia, everyone. Um, Nazia from Cambridge University. Thank you so much for the uh, presentation, especially the case studies. Um, so, my quick question to you. Um, how do you see the, it's very enlightening to see a lot of the success stories, but from my research experience and our group's research experience, we do find the contract farmers often do not um, uh, take their contract uh, loss seriously, and they will walk out of these small farmers uh, when the prices are not convenient for them. And African countries where we have studied the law of contract farming, we have found that 54% of the contracts were not even written, or the government agencies, the law firms, did not even know that there was a contract farming going on. And that, I wonder if you have come across in your case studies, and if so, how you have 
manage to see this experience are different from the experience that we see as a big cause of market failure um, in terms of scaling up small farmers within the global value chain. And the second question, um, you haven't touched anything on the genetically modified crops, but we do realize that 54% growth rate of the GM crops, especially in fruits and vegetables, are coming from the developing countries. And if we are talking about scaling up these global value chains from the small farmers to the urban areas where food consciousness in terms of GMOs, especially in the Western market, are being challenged, how do you see that is affecting the potential of these farmers to continue to stay competitive in this space if the government, without their consensus, uh, goes and approve a GM tomato or potato? Um, uh, because Farmers' union voice are not quite as present in those uh, ISAA meetings when they're looking into the uh, uh, GM crops adaptations because it is a big part of uh, technology's growth. So those two questions are really interesting to see how you see that uh, challenge with some of the inputs. Thank you. Thanks very much. Quite a few questions, quite a few additional perspectives and comments. I suggest. We have a quick run through, and then um, if anyone is not happy with the answers they uh, got, I suggest we take it to uh, lunch uh, individually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the question. I will start with um, the last question on the GMOs. Uh, my perspective of the GMOs uh, smallholder farmers, they don't have the um, capital to maybe to buy the inputs. Normally they use the open pollinated varieties which they can take from um, from their granaries. But uh, if maybe let's say the government approves the GMO policy maybe to have uh, GMOs being grown, I think it's going to be very tough for the small water farmers. It will benefit more of the big guys than the small water guys. And we have uh, big guys producing massively now flat in the market and that would affect the smaller guys. Then uh, going to the contract farming, um, how we have managed to, we have tried maybe to solve the problems associated with the contract farming um, model is to involve um, the government and we also capacitate the companies. Some of the companies, they don't even know how to draft a contract which is binding. So the first thing when we engage a company is to understand their challenges, go through their contract, and make sure that all the key concepts of the contract are there. There is a facilitating development added who went down before the company comes to contract the farmers to train the farmers on their roles and responsibilities within that contract farming agreement to make sure that they understand we we'll do that together with the company. Um, so I think partly we have managed to solve uh, that problem. The horticulture we did in 2014, but after it failed with the open market, um, all the other crops that I mentioned, the sesame, the man, the flowers, uh, the chilies, they are all working on under contract farming. Um, we, of course, they are here, here and there. The companies may change the goalposts, um, but um, we have been working closely with the companies, advising them on their on, on the repackages that will that would be there if they breach the contract uh, for the next companies. The other thing is we have translated the contracts into vernacular language. Um, we, first, we help the company to translate the contract from English to vernacular language that is understood by the farmers so that farmers, even without us, without our facilitation, we can read the contract and understand um, the contract. Then, um, on aggregation and uh, the question which came on aggregation and logistics, uh, the major challenge is we have tried our best to capacitate the farmers, but there are issues to do with trust. Farmers can't trust one another. They can't trust that if we send one person, we will bring the money for 30 people. That can't work. They will trust me if I take their 30 ton produce from 1,200 farmers, they will trust that I will bring the money. They can't trust one another to say, yeah, I can take the responsibility to take our produce to market. And there are lots of cultural issues. Maybe um, the different families, they, they have with previous conflicts. Uh, that affects the whole working relationship. So in as much as we try to educate the farmers, those um, dynamics to do with the cultural and trust issues are the major hindering factor. 
around uh, organizing farmers and doing logistics efficient. Um, I, I, I need to change the mindset. I, um, I'm not sure how best to, <laughs> to tackle that one, but that's the biggest challenge, the trust issues. Um, then on the quality, that um, we depend on the quality that is given by the consumers and the markets. Um, <coughs> that we might drive the biodiversity and the food diversity. Uh, I think working with primarily is the consumer who determines what they want to buy. So the market or the supermarket they are just responding to the consumer needs. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a bit tough, but um, I mentioned that there is an opportunity for companies to introduce new, maybe niche um, crops that they can get. There are always those niche markets. markets. Uh, the consumers might not be aware that there are these varieties. Um, I, only, I only know what I have been exposed to. So if the companies can tap on the other existing uh, crops or varieties that are within uh, the communities and realize that is a business opportunity. I think that's how we can um, we can solve um, that problem. Um, then the first question, um, I didn't get it rightly, but um, what I got was um, the recommendation that I made that the donors need to spend more time on. Uh, creating an urban environment for companies to work with, um, with small water farmers. Um, so one of the biggest challenges, it's, it's quite tough for a company to go into a community, the registration, the taxation, uh, the process to go work in a certain community is quite challenging. Um, so it's the role of the government to create that enabling environment that would facilitate trade between smallholder guys and the companies. We need that uh, facilitation. Um, so very little that we can do within the three years or maybe four years that we are implementing a program to change that. So if maybe at donor level engaging the governments to change that enabling environment, like I'll give you an example currently. Um, uh, maize is being bought at 390, which is um, a floor price, is it floor from the government? But in the regional price is below the 390s, around $300. Um, so the private sector will just pull out, not buy from the farmers, or they will go and buy at the lowest cost. So that creation of an enabling environment is very important for the functioning of the market system. I'm not sure if I answered the first question. Well, there was uh, one key question. Uh, I think you asked the key question, how to make the rural setting more attractive? Okay. Um, who is the actor in this game? Who is going to make the rural area more attractive? Let's not talk about um, uh, donor-funded projects or government um, interventions. But uh, first look at uh, what the people in the rural area are doing themselves. Uh, but I mentioned uh, in uh, my description of multi-locality, uh, uh, multi and household arrangements that there's a uh, lot of uh, transfer of funds, of uh, remittances going back to the rural areas, and this goes back to the rural part of the household, it helps them um, to invest in uh, irrigation technology and so on. The disadvantage about this is, this is within the household. And uh, in order to make the rural area more attractive, one has to go beyond the household to the entire locality. And I think uh, this is a big challenge. There are very few examples where this has happened. I know of an example in Mali where um, uh, an association in a, 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 a diaspora association in Paris is funding projects, small infrastructure projects in their home village, which is still the exception. But uh, uh, they, uh, uh, they pool their money to, um, uh, to give funding uh, for a small library, for a community <coughs> centre and things like this. There are very few examples. There are even fewer examples of um, doing this for productive investment. Say, a group 
of people getting together, a group of people in the urban area getting together uh, to give funding for uh, well, maize mill or uh, some bigger investment which is needed to make the rural place more attractive. But I think this is uh, somehow the direction. And um, well, um, maybe I can also mention an anecdote. Uh, I did a study on the informal sector in Ghana and I interviewed a person in uh, Kumasi, a big city in Kumasi, and I found out about uh, the operations of this multi-locational household. He, was, he had set up a drum factory. And in order to produce uh, the drums, he needed raw materials from North Angana. So there was, uh, I studied uh, the linkages between uh, the North Angana household, uh, this rural household in North Angana, and the drum factory. Okay, uh, after a while, his business had become quite successful. And uh, uh, at that time, that was about the same time when uh, cocoa prices were liberalized in the country, and then he decided to invest in the rural area, but not in his home village, but in the cocoa belt in the country. So I think uh, the interesting thing about this story is uh, that migration is not always unidirectional, not only from rural area to the big city or from a small town uh, to uh, the big city, but uh, it can also go into the opposite direction. And there are all kinds of economic initiatives which need to be studied. And um, maybe uh, some of these things can be replicated and even projects, when we talk about project design, can incorporate some of these ideas. Thank you.